Executive De D Director Radu, would you please read the roll? Regent Bailing. Here. Regent Bradley. Regent Delgado. Regent Erickson. Here. Regent Evers. Regent Farrell. Here. Regent Greeby. Here. Regent Hall. Regent Higgins. Here. Regent Klein. Here. Regent Langness. Here. Regent Many Deeds. Regent Milner. Here. Regent Mueller. Here. Regent Peterson. Here. Regent Stile. Here. Regent Tyler. Here. Regent Whitburn. Here. A quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, before we, um, I asked for a motion for the minutes from our previous meeting, uh, Regent Tyler called to my attention that we have, today is National Manufacturing Day. And uh, it, it, it's good to note that in Wisconsin, uh, our total output is 50 billion, that's B, with a B, billion dollars, per year, and that was in 2012, and I imagine that may have grown since then. And of our uh, exports, 95% of our exports are from manufactured products. Now, that also includes the manufactured agricultural products. So I think that's worth noting, particularly since we are in one of our manufacturing centers up here. So thank you very much for calling that to our attention. All right, the minutes of the August 2016 Board of Regents meeting have been provided. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? Absolutely. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, the reports of the Higher Education AIDS Board and the Wisconsin Technical College System Board have been provided. Are there any questions or comments? All right, hearing none. Uh, let's proceed with our meeting this morning. Good morning. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to again say thank you to Chancellor Schmidt and the UW-Eau Claire camp com campus community for your outstanding hospitality and providing us with that excellent weather yesterday. It's been a real treat to share in your centennial celebrations from the Blue Gold Band performance to the impressive presentation to the, of the, the, uh, to the groundbreaking yesterday at the Confluence Arts Center site. The campus has, uh, well, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention this morning, the, uh, the, the chorale this morning, which started our Friday so well. This campus has many reasons to be proud and wish you well in your next hundred years. I'm going to start my uh, report with a couple of task force updates. First, the tuition setting policy task force has been on a bit of a hiatus since August as we needed to have all hands on deck to address the biennial budget request at that time. The task force under the leadership of Regent Higgins will resume its charge next month. Their good work will inform how we set tuition <laughs> for the 2019-2021 20, um, biennium and beyond. As for the task force on campus climate, so that far this fall we have received nominations for membership from all chancellors and we've been working to develop a focus charge for the group. I know that Regent Hall and many deeds who are serving as co-chair are looking forward to scheduling the first meeting with the task force as soon after the members have been announced. On the budget front, our outreach and advocacy has been picking up momentum related to the 2020 forward framework and the budget proposal we've approved and advanced in August. In mid-September, Chancellor Blank led a UW-Madison budget forum and I was pleased to be part of that budget forum. I also had an opportunity recently to address the UW-Madison Board of Visitors for the History Department. It was clear at both events that people are very proud of their university and are deeply committed to its success. All around the state, there have been a variety of venues and opportunities for us to engage our stakeholders, and that will certainly continue in the coming months. I want to thank Vice President Bailing for joining me in the joint op-ed in late August, stressing the value of the UW system and the need for a shared investment 
with our colleagues at the, at the legislature. Regent Peterson has also had an opportunity to address colleagues on the 2020 Forward Plan, and I see other regents reaching out for resources to help keep the facts and the messages reinforcing the UW system's value in all fronts of peer, industry peers, community leaders, and legislators, and others throughout the state. I could go on and recognize more good works from our colleagues in these efforts. There is a lot to cite. But let me just say that we are greatly appreciate the time and the energy all of you around this, uh, around this board are investing. I urge all of us to continue attending campus events, speaking about the UW system at local organizations, and engaging in other positive ways with, legislat with legislators and with the public. I also remind you that our uh, university relations team and the staff at each of our institutions are more than willing to provide materials and background and any other support that each of you might need. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to Stephanie, our Interim Director of Communications. Finally, President Cross is usually the one to share good news from our campuses, but I'm going to get things started for him. As you know, the general theme for this month is business and community mobilization, which is one of the cornerstones of the 2020 Forward Strategic Framework. With that backdrop in mind, I am pleased to share the news that UW-Superior has been recognized just last week as a national leader in community engagement by being named to the President's Higher Education Community Service Honor Roll. UW-Superior is the only school within the region to receive this honor. It is the highest federal recognition an institution can receive for its commitment to the community, to service learning, and civic engagement. Our congratulations to Chancellor Wachter and to the UW-Superior campus community. Let's give them all applause, please. And with that, the sun is coming out. Now I will turn it over to President Cross. Thank you, uh, Regent President Milner. Uh, let me start with some update on the legislative uh, on the front. Um, uh, with fall elections coming soon, um, as most of you know, our attention turns to politics. Uh, it's part of our strategy to help them understand our strategic framework, where we're going and <coughs> why. At the same time, our institutions are engaging their local candidates, and that's one of our important strategies. Our UW system team has also been actively engaging the governor's office, key legislative leaders, and on many different aspects of the budget, they've been meeting with specific legislators as well as state agencies. Uh, in addition to the budget, we're also identifying key legislators uh, who have initiatives and ideas that we might fit our uh, activities into. We had a robust legislative review and tracking process to try to understand who's proposing to introduce something that we may not be aware of. On the federal front, uh, Kurt Bauer, President and CEO of Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, both of us, he and I, recently co-signed a letter to the Wisconsin members of the congressional delegation expressing our strong support for the Manufacturing Universities Act. This act has been introduced in both the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives to establish a program to, to designate 25 institutions of higher education as U.S. manufacturing universities. And I think that's entirely appropriate uh, given that this is Manufacturing Month. The goal of the legislation is to step up advanced manufacturing and engineering programs at universities across the country by providing incentives for universities to partner with manufacturing firms in their regions to increase training opportunities and foster manufacturing entrepreneurship. As you know, this is important to our state. Uh, we have approximately 9,400 manufacturers that employ about 450,000 workers, nearly 17% of the state's workforce. 
Manufacturing contributes $50 billion to the economy of this state. We've asked our delegation to co-sponsor the legislation, emphasizing that Wisconsin manufacturers and universities have the collaborative relationships and partnerships in place to successfully compete for designation as a U.S. manufacturing university. To date, Wisconsin co-sponsors include Senator Baldwin, Congressman Pocan, Kind, and Ribble. And now I'd like to share some news from around the system. Last week, the international news agency Reuters released its top 100 rankings of the most innovative university systems in the world for 2016. I'm proud to report that the UW system ranks 13, number 13 worldwide. The Reuters list relies exclusively on empirical data, such as patent filings and research paper citations, and it ranks the educational institutions doing the most to advance science, invent new technologies, and help drive the global economy. We have a $15 billion impact on Wisconsin's economy each year, and this report signals why it is critical we invest in the success of the UW system. So let's continue with our host campus, and thanks to community partnerships with companies like Excel Energy, UW Eau Claire is able to offer programs, financial support, and high impact practices for students and community members that wouldn't otherwise be possible. The Excel Energy Foundation has been a steadfast partner since 1961. Its annual gift of 15,000 to the Eau Claire Foundation goes to continued to continue support of, of student scholarships to, to support key outreach programs such as Blue Gold Beginnings and high impact practices that truly transform student learning. Well done, Chancellor Schmidt. At UW Parkside, a multicultural community conversation was held in September that brought together representatives of businesses, community uh, organizations, K-12 education, and workforce development. It was the second time this group has met with the important goal of identifying opportunities to help students of color participate in higher education and succeed. Congratulations, Chancellor Ford, and hopefully you'll keep us posted on the results of future conversations. UW River Falls exhibited its Green Wall research at this summer's Minnesota State Fair. The exhibit included activities and a full-size version of the foliage wall or vertical vegetation system. This was installed on campus in 2015 to study the effects of greenery and plants on student behavior, mood, and classroom performance. Kind of interesting stuff, Chancellor Van Galen. UW Whitewater Associate Professor Eric Compass pronounced in his, uh, to his students who work with the Rock River Coalition on a 10-day project called Testing the Waters, a sampling of the Rock River between Horicon and Beloit. Kayaks fixed with scientific equipment provided data on dissolved oxygen levels, pH levels, uh, electrical conductivity, and temperature. And you can watch a video at our website, a fantastic endeavor and service to the region, Professor Compass and Chancellor Copper. Hopefully they'll devise a system to power those kayaks as well, so that would be helpful for all of us. UW, uh, a U.S. News & World Report uh, 2017 America's Best Colleges ranks UW La Crosse as the state's best and the, the number four public university in its list of best regional universities in the Midwest. It's the 16th year in a row that UWL has remained the state's top ranked among UW system comprehensives and the top four and in the top four in the Midwest. Outstanding work, Chancellor Gao. UW Stout's Harvey Hall, which opened in 1916, celebrated a grand reopening in September after a $28 million renovation. The renovation process preserved the historic architecture and character of the academic building while adding much needed modern amenities. I was pleased to attend the grand, open, grand reopening. They've done a beautiful job with that facility, so congratulations, Chance, Chancellor Meyer. UW Green Bay kicked off the fourth year of its innovative Gateways to Phoenix Success, their GPS program. The program is designed to help 160 new freshmen, most from underserved populations, navigate through their first year of college. More than 70% of this year's cohort 
comes from historically underrepresented groups. First generation, low income, and or students of color. GPS is a free, high impact, year long experience for first year students that provides a fast path to college success. The goal is to eliminate gaps in the achievement and the academic achievement area. This is 2020 forward in action, and we wish you all the best, Chancellor Miller. UW Superior and Wisconsin Indian Head Technical College announced a new articulation agreement in early childhood education. Any student enrolled in the Wisconsin Technical College system with an early childhood education associate of applied science degree can make a seamless transition to UW Superior by transferring the credits they earned in that program to UW Superior for a Bachelor of Science degree in early or in elementary education and early childhood minor. UW Superior's elementary education program is available both on campus and online. Well done, uh, Chancellor Wachter. UW Oshkosh and Marquette, Marquette University have partnered to offer an accelerated path to an economics master's degree. Through the partnership, Marquette accepts certain upper-level UW Oshkosh econ electives for graduate credit for students accepted into the program, which ultimately reduces the time requirement, requirement in the graduate program at Marquette to one year. UW Oshkosh is the only public university in the country that currently has this partnership with Marquette. So congratulations, UW Oshkosh and Chancellor Levitt. And I want to add one more note for UW Oshkosh. Chancellor Levitt recently received the FIT Oshkosh Incorporated Inaugural Racial Literary Literacy Hero Award for his, quote, visible leadership and commitment to increasing the racial literacy of the residents of Winnebago County within the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and in all places of influence. Congratulations, Andy. UW-Madison and its many partners will celebrate the 2016 Wisconsin Science Festival later this month. Now in its sixth year, the festival will feature 200 plus events in October later this month. The festival continues to grow and now spans 34 cities and towns in Wisconsin. Activities include arcade games, storytelling, and stargazing, all designed to interest people who may not think they are interested in science. Congratul congratulations to Laura Heisler, director of the festival and director of programming for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. And of course, to the Mortgage Institute for Research. So thanks to your commitment to this and congratulations, Chancellor Blank. UW Stevens Point, uh, UW Stevens Point sophomore, uh, Mara Hathaway is majoring in biology, minoring in chemistry, and dreams of working in veterinary science. She also serves as a turtle wrangler Mara, one of five student turtle wranglers, I just have fun saying that, and it's <laughs> has worked with biology lecturer Nancy Shefferly since April to keep turtles safe along a stretch of Highway 66 near Jordan Park in Stevens Point. The Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has identified the turtle wranglers worksite as one of the state's most dangerous wildlife crossings. So the extra support and expertise is deeply valued. It's a great partnership and it sounds like a lot of fun. Congratulations, Chancellor Patterson. UW Platteville hosted the second annual 21st Century Policing Conference in September to address national policing issues. About 400 people attended. Issues discussed in, during presentations, panels, and breakout sessions included an appropriate workforce, a police workforce, building community trust, de-escalation training, the, the intersection of policing and mental illness, restorative justice, and more. This is an important topic and we appreciate your leadership role in this, Chancellor Shields. You did in Mar Marshfield, Wood County, broke ground on the long-awaited Everett uh, Rail Science Technology Engineering and Math Center on September 13th. The 17,000 square foot addition to the campus will house new chemistry, bi microbiology, and simulation laboratories. It is funded in partnership between the city of Marshfield, Wood County, and support from trucking magnet Everett Rail and numerous uh, other private donors. The center is expected to open in the fall of 2017. Fantastic collaboration, Chancellor Sandine. 
Collaborative online degree programs led by UW Extension, including 12 UW system campuses, have seen rapid enrollment growth. At the start of, of fall 2016 semester, course enrollments increased 12.4 percent over 2015. This growth exceeds national online enrollment growth of only about 3 to 4 percent. The collaborative program experiencing the fastest enrollment growth is the online Master of Science in Data Science. In its first year, course enrollments doubled targets 12 UW system campuses are involved in the collaborative online degree programs. Congratulations to all involved, including UW Extension's Division of Continuing Ed, Outreach, and E-Learning. And last but certainly not least today, we jump to UW-Milwaukee. I want to brighten the already stunning spotlight on theater professor Ann Basting. You may have heard last month that she was named a 2016 MacArthur Fellow. This is the fellowship and award commonly known, known as the Genius Grant. Professor Basting is one of 25 new fellows nationally this year. 23, let me correct that. And the first UW faculty member to earn the esteemed MacArthur Foundation's highest honor. She earns it for her work and creative focus through UWM's Peck School of the Arts. She is an expert in integrating arts into aging services and long-term care. As UWM has highlighted, She's founder of the Creative Trust, an alliance that fosters lifelong learning through the arts and support of student artists in residence program connecting students with aging service, services organizations. This includes her Time Slips Creative Storytelling Initiative, which works with people living with dementia and memory loss. I'm excited to report that we will have an opportunity to hear from Professor Basing directly next month when she joins us in the faculty spotlight at our meeting in Madison. Professor Basing is truly helping improve the human condition here in Wisconsin, and I say hats off to her, and congratulations to Chancellor Mone and UW, and the whole UW-Milwaukee community. If you want more examples of our impact throughout Wisconsin, we have them. Just head over to our website, Every single one is a source of pride and a demonstration of our work to improve the quality of life and the prosperity of more people, organizations, businesses, and communities within our state. I hope you are as proud of them as I am. Speaking of helping people and communities grow and thrive, next we turn to our student spotlight this month. It is my pleasure to introduce Derek Dalek a UW Eau Claire senior majoring in liberal studies with a focus on critical theory and public policy. Derek, who is from Verona, has been working on a project dealing with solar policy, public art, water conservation, and nutrition planning. He also works with the City of Eau Claire's Advisory Commission on Sustainability, creating policy briefs and promotional materials about solar policy and water conser conservation. So let me share a quote from Dr. James Bolter, director of the Watershed Institute here at Eau Claire, on the larger impact of this partnership and the university's close relationship with the city. Dr. Bolter says, it's very easy for a university to be off in our own corner of the community, but through these kinds of relationships over years and years where these interns keep coming back, this means that the university is really serving the committee, community and the state. With that, let me introduce the board and our guest today to Derek Dalek. Derek, welcome. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I'll just introduce myself again, even though I got that wonderful introduction from Ray. Um, my name is Derek William Dalk, and I'm a senior studying critical theory and public policy under the Liberal Studies program here at Eau Claire. Uh, thank you for this opportunity today to showcase my personal experience and the future that I envision for our campuses. Four years ago, I arrived to this basin of knowledge amongst the Chippewa, and my education at UWC has, like the river's rush, eroded the socialized sediment and rocky edges of my past identity. Over the past two years specifically, I've become absorbed into the idea of collaboration. What I'm going to talk to you about today is the necessity of collaboration in building futures for our students, communities, and institutions. 
My desire for collaboration and civic engagement began in the spring in a sustainable cities course with Dr. David Soule. In that course, students worked in conjunction with city officials on a civic engagement project of our choosing. I personally worked with fellow students to create a public art policy manual outlining the high potential of an art economy in Eau Claire and a collaborative public-private funding mechanism for art in the city. During my time working on public art policy, I also became involved with a health impact assessment for the redevelopment of a former industrial district. While working with the redevelopment, I focused my research on strategies for fighting gentrification and improving food access for lower income communities. I met with old ladies wanting safe spaces for their grandkids, a local principal who wanted to ensure bike access to the planned park, and received input from local business owners on the development process. Meetings, meeting these local, or local leaders allowed me to expand both my connections in the city and my perception of the city. As I worked with individuals from public and private spheres and with a myriad of personal interests, I realized the importance of multifaceted collaborative solutions to modern community issues. From my early work with the city, I gained a connection with Ned Noel, a brilliant and compassionate Eau Claire City planner. Ned offered me an internship position in the community planning department, and over the summer, I worked on a variety of pro projects emphasizing sustainability. I created a brochure for Eau Claire's new solar ordinance, a policy brief on a water conservation resolution, and worked on the city of Eau Claire's first crime prevention through environmental design manual. Dr. Jim Bolter, who was referenced before, uh, is a wise and whimsical chemistry professor who provided me with valuable guidance throughout the process. He helped me receive three credits through the Watershed Institute for the internship and provided me with the resources to set the foundations for Eau Claire's first comprehensive municipal greenhouse gas inventory. Student faculty connections and collaborations have been the most important thing about my education here at Eau Claire. I really began to think about how attachment to teachers affects educational experience during my time studying abroad. In the spring of 2015, I had the opportunity to go to Harlixton College in Grantham, England through a partnership Eau Claire has with the University of Evansville. Besides an addiction to tea, I picked up a lot of interesting insights about the educational process there. At lunch, we would see our faculty and administration eating together with the students. They lived with us, ate with us, and socialized with us. This experience led to me researching and reflecting on the effect that attachment to professors has on education. I believe that attachment to a professor gives students an incentive to perform, reduces educationally deviant behavior, increases classroom conversation, and gives students the comfort to produce novel research. I also believe that those same factors are part of UW-Eau Claire's recent ranking as the number one master's level undergraduate research program by the Council on Undergraduate Research. Beyond external campus community collaborations, campus also, campuses also need to focus on collaboration between their own spheres. You can have the same issue on a campus, and students, faculty, and administration will have a different, they'll see very different problems and compose vastly different solutions to those problems. It would be amazing to see students, faculty, and administration come together to create collaborative narratives for their campuses and the communities that they hope to see into the future. Campuses have a responsibility to take on social issues that have damaging effects on their students' lives, and that collaboration could really challenge a lot of the uh, fundamental negativities that people face every day. And sharing social responsibilities between campuses, private organizations, and local authorities um, improves the efficiency and is mutually beneficial to all parties involved. It's um, that collaboration helps each different group. It increases efficiency because you have, instead of all these different spheres kind of working on their own personal missions, you come together and you can pool resources and student resources, human capital together to fight actual issues in the community, as well as develop new products and knowledge. It goes into a lot of different things. And uh, UW-Madison's University Alliance is one of the most interesting examples of this form of collaboration that I've encountered, as it brings research centers, students, and local leaders together to improve local health. I've discussed the necessity of cam community campus collaboration and student faculty administration collaboration for solving social issues. But the final part of my talk will emphasize collaboration between departments and the future of research. Dr. David Orr, in his article, What is Education For?, describes the necessity of a radical interdisciplinarity to contrast the regiments of academic disciplines. Creative developments occur out of a blending of disciplines, and often a group of professionals, all with the same perspective, will not see the total, um, or if there's an error in a thesis from a certain perspective, and they have a whole group all applying the same direction of view, 
then you can miss some errors in the thesis from another angle. And I believe education in theory is a necessary step in developing students with an interdisciplinary mindset. The liberal studies program has allowed me to orient my education towards the interdisciplinarity I value. In our program, we can select three areas of emphasis. My personal degree is composed of theory courses, civic engagement, and history. Everything in the external world has a human interpretation, a theory to it, a history to its existence, and a practical application based on its interpreted identity. On our campus, I've been able to take a wide range of theory courses. I've taken two critical theory courses through our English department, international relations theory, contemporary political theory, economic theory, and some of my most mind-opening theory courses were postmodern theory with the hypercritical and fragmented Dr. Jose Alvergue, and social theory with the biggest social troll and theory geek I know, Dr. Jeff Herger. I believe that studies in interdisciplinary theory have been incredibly beneficial for me as a researcher, and the importance of theory should be elevated on campuses. That is also why I'm in the process of building an organization called the Community Theory Organization that works to integrate academic knowledge into our communities, sponsor positive activism, and encourage people to break down their boundaries to create productive narratives with each other. I have been proud and excited and unsurprised to see that Eau Claire's master plan for civic engagement fits onto several of my ambitions for community revitalization. I was going to end with my personal ambitions for the future, but my personal ambitions are the way I wish to see the, the world to be. I have changed with my wishes for the world, and my dreams for the future of all are my dreams for self. As long as I push forward the world I hope to live in, I've lived well and in harmony with my knowledge. Thank you again for this opportunity, and peaceful passings to all in cultivating the future. you missed one or two of them, uh, he referred to educationally deviant behavior. I don't know really what that is, but he also, um, uh, he also talked about social trolls. It was a kind of an interesting phrase. And then he referenced university year, something that is in our strategic framework and something we want to expand around the system. So thanks, Derek. Congratulations. Yes, Derek, and I would like to, we would like to thank you, too, for sharing your experience. Uh, and let me commend the City of Eau Claire for its partnership with UW-Eau Claire in providing what is clearly an educational experience that benefits both students and the community. That is what business and community mobilization is all about. Now, we're going to move into the business section of our meeting. And I will call on Regent Hall to present the report of the Research Economic Development and Innovation Committee. Regent Hall. The University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health presented their annual report. Um, just a, a background. When Blue Cross and Blue Shield United of Wisconsin converted from a nonprofit service corporation to a stock insurance corporation, the proceeds from the sale of stock were provided to the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Medical College of Wisconsin to form the Wisconsin Partnership Program. Every year, the annual report that details the program's activities and expenditures is presented to the Board of Regents. Dean Robert N. Golden provided a brief Some of the highlights from the 2015 report included 186 awarded through 420 Wisconsin partnerships, averaging of initial funds to successfully for three. 126 million in extramural funds and the launch of two new community grant programs serving a range of health issues facing Wisconsin communities including obesity, alcohol and other drug abuse, child abuse and mental health. Wisconsin Partnership Program has numerous other examples 
of its impactful work and outcomes that are outlined in the full 2015 annual report. Uh, Dean Golden then presented the four recommended appointees for the Oversight and Advisory Committee of the Wisconsin Partnership Program. The Ready Committee reviewed the following candidates, uh, Gregory Nice, Kenneth Taylor, and Drs. Robert F. Lemansky and, Pres I'm sorry, and Patrick Remington. And we unanimously approved all of them for reappointment. Um, President Regent Milner, I now move for the adoption of the Resolution 14C that will approve the appointment of these candidates to the Oversight and Advisory Committee of the Wisconsin Partnership Program for four-year terms beginning November 1, 2016. Thank you. Um, any questions or discussion? All in favor, at yay. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank we'll you, Regent Hall. We'll continue. You have more? A couple Thank more. you. Just wanted to make sure we voted. Um, UW College's Professor Krista James Burns presented the competitive project that took top honors at the 2016 National Rube Goldberg Challenge. Under her direction, a team of UW Barron County engineering students built a Nikola Tesla themed umbrella opening machine that won first place at the national final held in Columbia in Columbus, Ohio. You can see the machine on the screen. The competition drew teams from Purdue, the University of California, Berkeley, Penn State, and many others. So it was quite a competition. We're very proud of their accomplishments and of these exemplary UW students. In fact, Professor Krista James Burns was also recently honored with the 2016 Career Award from the UW Colleges and University Extension. She is here with us today. So, Professor James Burns, would you please stand so we can recognize you for your outstanding work. I have to tell you the presentation, for those that uh, did not see it, phenomenal students and her leadership uh, was shining very brightly as she guided those students and encouraged them. Finally, um, the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire is consistently rated among the top ten public Midwestern comprehensive universities and conservatively contributes $300 million of economic impact to the state. UW Eau Claire Chancellor Jim Schmidt, our host, led a discussion panel of regional business and healthcare leaders on how Eau Claire is expanding innovative partnerships to strengthen the region. The panel included Dr. Randy Linton, President and CEO of the Northwest Wisconsin Region of Mayo Clinic Health System, Julie Manis, President and CEO of the Sacred Heart Hospital, HSHS, Nick Meyer, editor, publisher, and owner of Volume One, who also happens to be a graduate of Eau Claire, a um, very promising entrepreneur who has employed a number of students, and Mark Steering, president of Excel Energy of Michigan and Wisconsin. That completes my report. Thank you. I had an opportunity to just sit in on the, the Ready Committee meeting when the students who had from Barron County had, uh, uh, per, uh, were explaining their, their, the work that they've done, and it was really extraordinary. They, they beat uh, a lot of very significant university teams, so congratulations. Now, um, I call on Regent Mueller to present a report of the action taken by the Business and Finance Committee. Regent Mueller. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Regent uh, President Milner. We began our discussion uh, hearing from Chancellor Schmidt about innovation and change at UW Eau Claire. He shared his thoughts on how they've adapted to the budget cuts at the same time as they are dealing with the second largest freshman enrollment uh, in recent history. Three of his key staff put together a, a film showing how they are working to improve and consolidate certain operations. A very interesting discussion. 
but we as a committee spent the bulk of our time discussing and reviewing the fiscal year 2016 UW system report on program revenue balances. You have that, all 200 pages of it, in your binders. And we looked at individual spending and savings plans included in that report. I'd like to emphasize that this is a snapshot of our program revenue reserves as of June 30. I would like to emphasize that the unrestricted uh, fund balances continue to decline as they have every year, particularly for tuition. Uh, our tuition balances declined from 551 million to 295.6 million. And what remains, it's important to understand, is either planned or obligated, the two highest categories of commitment on the spectrum that we use. And I'll give you a tip. I'll encourage you to review the appendices, which contain a great deal of information on the revenues and expenses at each campus and at system and system-wide. As you may recall, the legislature asked us to vote particularly on this every year before it is transmitted to them. So that'll be one of the resolutions I'll read in just a moment. We heard from UW-Madison staff on three master clinical trial agreements, one with Lilly USA, one with Macrogenics, and one with uh, Genentech. All are establishing general terms for individual studies that will take place. Each has an estimated value of over $1 million over the life of the term of these contracts. We approved a request from UW-Madison for an exception to board policy on large unendowed gifts. It's a request from the Mary and Lou Coyle Trust, uh, and it will allow the university to spend the full $500,000 for an intercollegiate athletic program, tennis in particular, for a tennis facility fundraising campaign. It'll be the lead uh, gift. We had updates in several areas, including policies related to health, safety, and security planning. Uh, thanks to the work of staff, there are now 10 broad areas that are searchable and available for um, anyone to see on what our policies are. And in light of enactment of that, we have to uh, repeal an outdated policy on security lighting. David Miller, our UW System Vice President for Administration and Fiscal Affairs, talked about some administrative policies. This is really bad, some back office functions, but it's very helpful in providing additional guidance to UW system institutions in the policy areas that we set broadly with region policy. David Miller also shared with us the work of the Information Assurance Council. That's a mouthful, but they're all working on efforts to uh, improve information security, which as we know is of great concern to both the Audit Committee and the Business and Finance Committee. Policy development is underway in several key areas of information security. Julie Gordon told us that the Legislative Audit Bureau is beginning its fiscal year 2015-16 financial audit. They'll do follow-up on past audits. That audit may be delayed because of some delays in receiving financial information from the state. Not from our end, correct, Julie, but from, from the state of Wisconsin. But otherwise, it's on time. And then finally, David Miller provided additional updates on both the HR system upgrade, which in the past had been a troubled system. We were delighted to hear it's still on target and is 75% of the way through testing. And he also provided an update of the core project, the operational reform and efficiencies project. And as I understand it, we're going to hear a great deal more about this at our November 16th meeting in Madison. The whole goal of that project is to provide more streamlined operations for our system. And with that, Madam President, on behalf of the Business and Finance Committee, I now move adoption of Resolution 12C, the important Program Revenue Balances Report, 12D, E, and F, with our, which are the contractual agreements with Lilly, Macrogenics, and Genentech. 1-2-G, which is the exception to board policy for the bequest for, from the Marion Lou Coyle Trust. 1-2-H-1, which is approval of the policy related to health, safety, and security planning. 
and then Resolution 12H2, which is a repeal of the outdated policy on security, lighting, and emergency telephones. All right, is there a second? Second. Now, is there any discussion about any of these resolutions? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Are there any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Regent Mueller. Moving on, I'll uh, now call upon Regent Whitburn to present a report of the actions taken by the Education Committee. In our meeting, the Education Committee approved an online Master of Science in Clinical Nutrition at Madison and an online Master of Science in Information Science and Technology at UWM. We had the second reading and then the approval of a revised mission statement at UW Oshkosh. We also approved changes in faculty personnel rules for UW Green Bay and also for UW Whitewater for Green Bay. The changes uh, dealt with graduate programs and related councils. At Whitewater, the changes dealt with complaints and grievances. We also provided approval of the creation of the Office of Educational Opportunity within the President's office. In the last state budget, you'll recall this office is provided uh, for the purpose of authorizing charter schools. Vice President Henderson uh, reported on progress being made at, at our campuses and institutions in the establishment of the required campus post-tenure review policies. We do hope uh, to have a number of them coming to the board in, uh, in November. I don't expect that we'll be fine-tuning these policies, by the way, in the committee. Rather, we'll expect the chancellors and provosts working with their faculties uh, to send forward to Tom Stafford's office campus policies that, in fact, square with our own system-wide policy. Dr. Henderson updated the committee on our current distance academic program array. Currently, we have 11 different undergraduate degree programs and 20 distinct master level programs offering uh, by way of distance delivery only. Total in, uh, fall enrollment in these uh, distance learning programs, about 4,300 students. And interestingly, the uh, enrollment levels remain constant in recent years. About 1,200 degrees are granted annually in these distance learning programs across our system. Stephen Collison briefed us on a system works, uh, systems work in connection with something called SARA. SARA is the State Authorization Recipro Reciprocity Agreement, which establishes a state law, uh, level re uh, reciprocity process that will support the nation when it comes to the approval of distance education courses and programs offered across state lines. This is important, and the good news is it's very affordable, not expensive for our system or the campuses. Finally, the committee was briefed uh, on UW Eau Claire's academic master plan. We heard an excellent presentation from Provost Klein. Just a couple of interesting factoids. This past year, the campus saw coming into the fall 6,513 potential freshmen apply. 5,079 were admitted, 2,303 enrolled. Among the, the enrollees, 50 Wisconsin high school valedictorians. Among the goals on the campus, academically, to increase the, president, the percentage of students lear, uh, uh, learning uh, abroad experiences from 25% moving toward 35 percent. They also have a significant em uh, emphasis on time to graduation with specific strategies in various majors and academic disciplines designed to increase the amount of four-year graduations. So consistent with the committee's action, I would move approval of Resolution 11C, 11D, E, F, 11G, and Resolution 11H. Is there a second? Second. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Thank you. 
The resolution is passed. I'll call upon Regent Grebe to present the report of the Audit Committee. We began with Lori Stortz, our Chief Audit Executive, briefly reviewing the status of the various audits that were approved as part of the fiscal 2017 audit plan. We're on track to have all scheduled audits completed by fiscal year end. We then moved into hearing reports from staff regarding recently committed, completed audits since our last meeting. Mary Libke briefly reviewed the Auxiliary Services Separation of Duties Information Technology Report for UW-Madison, uh, which was rated unsatisfactory. The focus of the audit was to determine if there was an adequate separation of duties at the union in the applications utilized to process financial transactions. Uh, Regent Mueller and other committee members uh, noted our disappointment with the comments surrounding passwords and security, especially in light of these significant dollars that are at risk. The committee heard from Jane Ober Oberdorf, the Assistant Director for Administration at Madison, regarding plans to address the comments that were raised in the audit. Steve Mantell briefly reviewed the international education reports for UW Parkside, which were also rated unsatisfactory. The committee then heard from Chancellor Ford regarding plans to address the comments, actually not plans to address the comments, the fact that the comments had already been addressed uh, in the report and the actions that had been taken uh, and put in place, noting that the issues raised had already been addressed and resolved. Mr. Mantell then briefly reviewed the UW Superior Emergency Preparedness Report, which was also unsatisfactory. Chief Business Officer Gigi Koenig from Superior discussed plans to address the comments identified in that report. Um, I would note that in each case of an unsatisfactory report, we heard from representatives of the campuses uh, who were all working hard to resolve those matters. Uh, Paul Radisky briefly reviewed the cash handling report for UW Parkside, which was satisfactory. Uh, Amanda Namer briefly reviewed the cash handling uh, custodian funds report for UW Madison, which was also satisfactory. Mr. Mantell briefly reviewed the cash handling report for Superior, which was satisfactory. Two grading uh, grading data security reports for Parkside and Oshkosh, both of which were satisfactory. An international education report for Whitewater, which was satisfactory. Seven emergency preparedness reports for Eau Claire, UW Extension, La Crosse, Parkside, Platteville, and Stevens Point, which were satisfactory, and one for River Falls, which was excellent. Uh, he also updated the committee on the system-wide uh, purchasing card report. Uh, the committee, led by Regent Mueller, did express some disappointment with the audit comments related to the purchasing card uh, uh, report. Um, Lori Storch stated that she will bring these comments to the next Chief Business Officer Conference for discussion. Uh, Mr. Mantell provided a summary of the progress that management has made toward resolving the comments and recommendations included in previous issued and open audit reports. Uh, and the committee was very pleased with the results uh, of that progress uh, and the fact that management is uh, moving towards implementing those comments uh, on a very effective basis. We then moved into closed session. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Um, I'm going to uh, make a comment. First of all, I want to compliment our internal audit, Lori Stortz. Uh, it's a uh, challenging job and we appreciate it. As you all know, internal audit is, uh, uh, is an introduction to this board. This is something that has only happened in the last few years. I believe that, uh, we all believe that doing and in, having an internal auditor and being able to do an internal audit function benefits us as an oversight board and also benefits each one of the campuses. So we very much appreciate the campus's cooperation in this and again I want to compliment Lori Stortz for her work on this. 
Moving on, I call on Regent Many Deeds to present the report of Capital Planning and Budget Committee. Thank you, President Milner. Uh, my fellow Regents, now for the report of the Regents' most exciting committee, Capital <laughs> Planning and Budget. We had uh, three interesting presentations. The first was given to us by Alex Rowe, who gave us uh, a very updated and informative uh, report regarding the condition of UW system facilities as reported by each institution and explained that the 2017 to 30, 2023 capital plan was addressing those conditions. However, there's not enough funding available to improve everything that we know about today. Um, the second presentation was by the campus, uh, our host campus, UW Eau Claire, which informed us, as you've heard yesterday and, and, and again this morning, about the campus and its community collaborations in regard to the facilities and how those in, uh, relationships and partnerships are enhancing both the community and the campus. And finally, uh, Alex presented us with the updates as to the State Building Commission actions. We then went to work on our resolutions, 1.3b, C, D, and E. Uh, the first one, B, is a resolution brought by the Eau Claire campus requesting authority to construct the Towers Hall renovation project to repair the exterior envelope and renovate both wings of the facility to enhance the quality of the residence hall experience for its students. Uh, the project involves the building's common spaces, upgrades to interior areas, expands resident bathrooms, replaces HVAC systems and exterior windows, and refurbishes both elevators in each tower. Since these uh, dorms are about as old as I am, believe me, they need it. Uh, <laughs> resolution C was brought by UW La Crosse, requesting authority to construct a 32,200 square foot addition to the Recreational Eagle Center to house an enlarged strength training space, a large multi-purpose recreation room, and other support, other support spaces. Uh, this is going to enhance the lives of the students on that campus. Resolution D was brought by UW-Madison, requested authority to lease space for the College of Letters and Science to facilitate the merger of the career initiative and career service units. The combined units will be able to offer a broader array of career services to students, visiting employers, alumni, uh, participating, participate, I can't speak now, participating faculty and corporate and business donors at one convenient location, uh, at, I think at the university bookstore location. And finally, E was brought by the system, and we uh, were asked to approve UW River Falls request for the South Fork Suites roof replacement, which is badly needed. And we approved all four of those resolutions, and I would move that this board approve resolutions 1, 3, B, C, D, and E. Okay. Uh, are there any questions or comments? All in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? It seems that we're going to be doing a lot of renovation, maintenance, and repairs. And considering uh, that uh, Regent Many Deeds has had his knee repaired, that you, you are a good person to lead us in this. A few more thousand miles out of the... <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yes. If you're taking part in that discussion at the Capital Planning, um, and reviewing all the materials, I think it's wise for us as an entity to discuss with the Department of Administration their 4% uh, amount that they take off all these projects and to justify it. All right. That will be taken under advisement. All right, we're going to be moving on. Uh, yesterday we had an opportunity to listen to the important work being done by uh, our campuses and the important work that we can do within our campuses with the business community. The importance that the, uh, that the business community can lend to our campuses and the importance that we can do for the economy of the state. But today we're going to pivot to an issue and a discussion that is key to everything that we do, which is accessibility and affordability. As we begin today, I want to invite President Cross to share, through, to share a few top thoughts on this topic. President Cross? Uh, thank you, Regent President Milner. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to recognize um, Representative Dana Walks, who just joined us. Uh, would you stand and be recognized? Appreciate that very much. Uh, 
another strong supporter of the university, and we appreciate it. Uh, as I begin this, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm probably not going to be telling you something that you don't already know. Hopefully I can express it in a different way. Uh, one of the biggest concerns facing families, and we heard it throughout our listening sessions, you heard it as a part of the Technology Council report yesterday, is the affordability of higher education in this country, and in particular, of course, for us within Wisconsin. In our 2020 forward listening sessions, more than 4,000, more than 5,000 people around the state uh, reinforced that message. It was a constant message. And I think you would have to have lived in another country not to be aware of that in the political discourse around the United States today. But something that came through I thought was interesting, business leaders were also worried about that and expressed that perhaps in some different ways. Uh, it was especially acute to them as they became more aware of the need for talent and the pressing demographic challenges facing us. <clears throat> when we talk about affordability, be it here or around our dinner tables, tuition is often the first thing mentioned. It's easy. It's something we all see. It's a bill parents or students get. But that's only a piece of it. It's important to understand, and I don't want to diminish the importance of tuition, but, and I hope you quote this line, let's not get tuition tunnel vision. If that's the only thing we look at, we're missing major, major factors, and I would argue more important ones. There are five major components to college affordability. Obviously, state funding. We call it general program revenue, GPR. Financial aid to students. The cost of the university experience. How do we determine what it, what it means to provide that experience and what does it cost to do that? Time to degree, perhaps the largest factor. And, of course, tuition. Those are five key factors. And something that's important, and I hope the board recognizes this, you have helped us deal with four of those already. First, state funding. We've asked for an increase of $42.5 million in new GPR funding for specific things, many of which tie to those five. <clears throat> funding to the University of Wisconsin system has declined by $362 million over the last five years in terms of state funding. And the request we made in August is an attempt to try to help us address some of the factors we heard in our listening session. So state funding is important. The second affordability factor is financial aid. At the June board meeting, this board requested an increase over the biennium of $19 million in new student financial aid. We have, in the state, we've, the, the, the Higher Education AIDS Board has received 58.3 million, I think, for the last seven years. There has not been an increase whatsoever in financial aid to students directly, not through us, but through the Higher Education Board for seven years. That's important. You've requested that. The third affordability factor is the cost of delivering this experience. How do we control that? We have been working, and you heard, you heard Jan mention that, uh, Regent Mueller, excuse me, mentioned that earlier. Uh, the, the, the operational reform excellence in order to streamline, in particular, but not just, our non-instructional activities. How do we improve those, re-engineer those processes, standardize, and streamline those processes. It's part of our commitment to operational reform. We're committed to doing that, and you'll hear more about that at our November board meeting. The fourth affordability factor is the time to degree, or some call it time to graduate. This is perhaps the largest factor. Let me give you a quick hypothetical. Let's assume we charge an additional $100 per semester for tuition. 
So over eight semesters, a four-year degree, that would cost you an extra $800. But if you have to stay an additional semester, that's a minimum of $5,000. Huge difference. Ability for us to help those students complete on time is an incredibly important affordability factor. Time to degree is a top priority for us. It's one of our, uh, it's one of our high priorities within the strategic framework. How do we not only reduce the number of credits in some areas that seem high, uh, that have grown over the years, but also how do we more efficiently deliver what we offer, provide advising support on both ends so that, that students more uh, effectively complete their degree on time. And finally, we arrive at the fifth affordability factor, tuition. Resident undergraduate tu tuition in the UW system has been frozen for the past four years. We all know that. The governor and some legislators have signaled they would like to freeze that for another year, and maybe further. And as you know, we have traditionally discussed tuition as a part of the annual budget in June or in uh, biennial budget years, July, so it alternates, only a few months before the start of the new school year. In other words, we're setting tuition in June or July for that August. That seems a bit, I don't know, odd. Families have difficult plan difficulty planning, and we, of course, as a university, are building our budget, in my terms, backwards. We establish our expenses first and then say, now we need the revenues in order to fund that. Rather than saying, what are our revenues? Okay, how do we match our expenses to our revenues? Does this timeline actually work, not only for the university, but for students or families? And I've had conversations individually with several of you, with legislators and with the governor's office, um, and with President, Regent President Milner, we both agree that it's time that we address not only the timing of this, but this fifth factor, tuition. To reiterate, we've already taken steps to deal with the first four that I mentioned. State support, financial aid, the cost of the university experience, and the time to degree. One factor that remains is tuition. It is therefore my recommendation that we discuss this final factor of college affordability today so that the university and families we serve have a better opportunity to plan for the future. President Milner. Thank you, President Cross. I mentioned earlier in my president report that the tuition setting policy task force shared by Regent Tim Higgins is making great progress. I am confident their work will play a significant part as we now inform our decision making and our tuition process into the future. As Regents, we are responsible for both actions in the present and strategic planning for the future. The Tuition Setting Task Force is an exa excellent example of planning for the future. Our upcoming discussion is about action in the present. As you all know, we are currently in the fourth year of a freeze on the resident undergraduate tuition. In fact, the last time there was a vote on resident undergraduate tuition was in June of 2012, which happens to be my very first meeting. That means many current board members have not participated in these tuition discussions before. As we consider setting tuition now, it may be useful to provide some background and some, historic, some historical context. Under state law, the Board of Regents of the UW system has the authority to set tuition. With that authority comes the critical responsibility to completely understand when and why tuition might be raised and how decisions on tuition factor into college affordability. Tuition typically supports only the instructional portion of the UW budget. Instructional costs include student services, supplies, and services. 
administration, libraries, support costs, and faculty salaries and fringe benefits, which comprise the largest portion of these costs. Tuition is impacted by changes in state funding and other factors. As President Cross has pointed out, the state GPR funding for the UW system has declined by $362 million from fiscal year 2012 through fiscal year 2017. Adjusted for inflation, our GPR function is now at its lowest level in UW system history. Significant reductions to state funding were made in eight of the last ten years. Typically, the Board of Regents increased tuition to partially offset these GPR base reductions. The Board's guiding principles for tuition settings state the following, quote, where general budget increases are not sufficient to maintain educational quality, Supplemental tuition increases should assist in redressing the imbalance between need and resources. Tuition increases should be moderate and predictable, subject to maintain quality." End quote. A tuition freeze is a popular thing, and yes, it provides relief in the short term, but we need to recognize that a freeze does not necessarily equal affordability. The quality of the university experience may be impacted if a tuition freeze is not offset and cost to students and family may actually increase. In other words, good intentions can sometimes lead to unintended consequences. Let me explain. In recent years, our chancellors and their campuses have done an admirable job of managing the double hit of reduced state funding and frozen tuition. System-wide, they have implemented cost savings and leverage inf uh, innovation to protect the university experience and provide the excellence that students and family expect and, reserve, and deserve. And I might add some of those changes will continue into the future regardless of funding and many of those changes reflect what was necessary in what all of us across the country are facing in higher education. Despite these efforts, however, there have been undeniable impacts. Students may have more difficulty getting the classes they need in a timely fashion, thus extending their time to graduation. As President Cross pointed out, even one extra semester can mean more than $5,000 in additional costs. On top of that, it means lost earning potential. As a former businesswoman, I'd like to expand on that by sharing how Chancellor Schmidt explained it to the Blue Gold community. If a UW Eau Claire student were able to graduate in four years, he says, their average starting salary is $44,000. When they can't get the classes they need and must take an extra year, the cost of that fifth year includes the lost salary as well as the tuition cost. So the opportunity cost of another year of school is $52,800 for students at UW Eau Claire. And I'm sure this experience has echoed across the system. The impact of both reducing state funding and freezing tuition also may make it more challenging over time to attract and retain high quality faculty and staff that are the hallmarks of the UW system. This is another example of responsibility the regions have to strategically plan for the future as we deal with the present. And strategically planning for the future means that we're not only looking at the next two years, but we are laying the course for the next six to ten years, the next decade. The bottom line is simple. Continued budget cuts and frozen tuition cannot be sustained. We are dedicated to keeping college affordable and as regents 
We are statutorily required to protect the quality of the college experience in the UW system. The budget request we that we approved in August is fiscally responsible. It includes initiatives to address college affordability by getting students through the educational pipeline faster so they graduate and enter the workforce quickly. The 2020 for forward framework expands the college credit options for high school students, increases college credit transfer options, and responds to the need of non-traditional students as well as working adults. I remind you that this request is directly linked to the feedback we heard in the strategic planning listening sessions we held all around the state, which, as President Cross said, included more than 5,000 citizens, business and community leaders, legislators, faculty, staff, and students. They all offered their input and told us how important it is to keep college affordable. Taking all these issues under consideration, and after consultation with President Cross, it is our joint recommendation that we take up this important issue today instead of in July, June or July. And perhaps this is the wisest idea for us to continue into the future because it provides more time for students and their families to plan. And it also allows the university more time to plan. Therefore, I support Resolution 210. Before I move adoption of this resolution, I'd ask Executive Director Radu to please read it. Radu? The resolution reads, whereas the Board of Regents affirms that the University of Wisconsin system is dedicated to providing an affordable, high-quality education for its students, and whereas affordability is influenced by the five key elements of time to degree, state support, financial aid, tuition, and cost to deliver the educational experience, and whereas the University of Wisconsin system is reducing time to degree by providing additional opportunities for high school students to complete college coursework, enhancing advising for UW students, and expanding seamless transfer opportunities, and whereas in August 2016, the Board of Regents and the University of Wisconsin system requested a reasonable increase in state general purpose revenue for the 2017-19 biennium to address the state's workforce and educational needs as guided by the 2020 forward strategic framework. And whereas, to better serve eligible UW students, in June 2016, the Board of Regents approved a request for an increase in state financial aid funding to be included in the Higher Educational AIDS Board, AIDS Board budget. And whereas, the University of Wisconsin system continues to address the cost to deliver the educational experience by creating operational efficiencies through standardizing, consolidating, and streamlining operations as expressed in the Commitment to Operational Reform and Effectiveness, core initiative. And whereas the Board of Regents recognizes that tuition is an important factor in maintaining affordability and would like to provide Wisconsin citizens with a fifth year of flat tuition for resident undergraduates in 2017-18. And whereas ultimately, a high quality education can only be delivered in a timely manner if tuition keeps pace with the cost of living. Be it therefore resolved that the Board of Regents approves a 0% increase in resident undergraduate tuition for the 2017-18 academic year and an increase of no more than the rate of the Consumer Price Index in 2018-19. And be it further resolved that the Board of Regents takes this action in the interest of maintaining a high quality educational experience for UW students, of giving Wisconsin students and their families the ability to plan ahead, and of promoting affordability. I move adoption of Resolution 210. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right, let's open the floor for discussion. Regent Whitburn. I think this business of the affordability of higher education is probably nationally and no reason to believe it isn't true in Wisconsin, a more critical issue than it's ever been before. So what we do here is an issue that we need to do carefully, timely, 
and with appropriate sensitivities. As Region President Milner has pointed out, our in-state residential undergraduate tuition has been flat for years. And the proposal is that we be comfortable with flatness in year five. I, for one, feel that planning to take our undergraduate residential tuition up in fiscal year 2019, an amount consistent with CPI is appropriate. It seems to me that the adjustment is modest and it should be affordable for students and for their families. And importantly, it is in fact required as we look at system and campus financials in the next biennium. Thank you. Regent Langness. Can you hear me? All right, thank you. Thank you, Regent President. Um, coming into this meeting, I prepared a, a short statement that I'd like to give. I, as a student, have personally benefited from the tuition freeze. My entire college career, I have not seen my tuition rise. Previous to me starting college, tuition increased at such a rate that caught the eye of not only students and parents, but the legislature and the governor, which led to a decline of trust in the UW system throughout the state of Wisconsin, and rightly so. Ever since, we have been working hard to regain this confidence and trust. I, as a business undergraduate student, understand that to maintain a sustainable, high quality educational system, that tuition cannot remain flat forever with external forces at work like inflation and the increase of cost of living. I realize that in the future, tuition will rise, but we must do so with great due diligence so as to keep the trust that we have earned back and so that we are accountable to the citizens of the great city of Wisconsin and so that we can continue to pursue truth and move forward together as a system, state, and people. Thank you. Thank you. Farrell? Thank you. I completely agree with your entire statement, uh, Mr. President Milner. I think the reminder that we are the board, the body that's supposed to set tuition to guarantee quality education is important for everybody to remember. Um, I think what um, Regent uh, Higgins is doing with the task force is something we all ought to be looking and focusing on very seriously. And I think some of the things you said are related to what should come out of that hearing, uh, that, that effort. I think that we should be, I agree so much that we have been doing it too late. How can a family plan in June for, for August, September? That, that when I was in the legislature, I thought it was a cockeyed way to do it. And so I completely agree with we sh our forward-looking planning on that. More importantly, though, I think we have got to have a meeting at which that is determined ahead of time at which we expect the 16 members of the Joint Finance Committee to attend. They act with less knowledge than they should have, and I say that as a former member of that body. And I think the more they can sit at the table with us and understand more fully what is involved in a tuition setting process for the sake of our families and for the sake of our quality education, we would all benefit from that. So that I completely agree with this. I think we should also look at including them. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yes, Regent Klein. Um, thank you, um, President Regent, President Milner, and President Cross. Um, this has been, I know, a thoughtful process, and I appreciate that. I want to, for the record, speak in favor of the resolution. I want to echo the thoughts of Regent Farrell. Uh, for the record, um, UW tuition is low compared to peer group institutions. It has historically been low. And I realize the fund balance issues were problematic in the past and lack transparency, but I believe um, that the legislature should restore the tuition setting authority to this board, and I love the idea of a joint meeting with joint finance. Um, the tuition should be set, uh, in my judgment, 
for the financial requirements of the institution to deliver a quality education, and that should be uh, the preeminent goal. Um, of course, keeping t tuition as affordable as possible in all situations. Two comments on time to degree. One is low tuition in itself can create more time to degree, and I think we've got to keep our eye on that. Um, you don't see the private schools having many fifth-year seniors, and that's because it's simply too expensive. So there's some relationship between low tuition and a longer time to graduation that I'm not sure how you fix or address but should be considered. Last but not least, I want to say um, the Office of the President sends out a lot of information to all of us regents. I try to read all of it and, and consider it. Oftentimes it gets filed. But the one thing I've been carrying around in my satchel is the UW Remedial Course Report, which is a legislated remedial course report I think we have to uh, submit to the legislature. And I, I want to say something that I think is really important, which is um, we've got a lot of students in this state that require remedial English and remedial math and especially remedial math. Now, if you have to take remedial math, your time to degree is longer, and you might not ever finish. So the value of the degree to you is very low. You get admitted, and you can't finish, or you can't finish in five years. And I think that this report is something that we ought to bring to the attention of the legislature if, they, if they're not already, their eye isn't on it, because it affects students in our poorest school districts um, primarily. And I think it's, it's really something we've got to keep our eye on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Regent Bailing. I just wanted to make a few words. As a parent who wrote a check last month to the UW, you never want to pay more. However, time to degree is really an economics issue. And I think that's what makes this resolution both timely and smart. We also heard from a number of business owners from the UW area yesterday. They want our UW graduates. They want them now. And so this resolution is not really just about parents, but it's also about employers and economic development. And so that's why I'm very supportive of this resolution today. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, I, I'd like to speak in favor of this uh, resolution. Um, and at the risk of uh, picking fly specks out of the pepper, um, I just want to verify that the calculation is a year over year and not a since we haven't had an increased calculation. So it's, it's not clear in here that this is a one year, year over year calculation. So I, I just want to verify that that is in fact true. Yes, that it, it's true. It, it would be the uh, CPIU as it's called. Uh, applied right before the, the um, when, whenever we would set the second year tuition, so wouldn't it wouldn't be an accumulated CPI? Is that what you I made that assumption? But just wanted to make okay. sure it was clear in the record. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Regent Higgins. Mr. President Milner and uh, President uh, Cross, you've uh, shown a great deal of concern about the. Uh, affordability of education in this resolution and uh, in the appointment of the Tuition Setting Policy Task Force. So we're, it's obvious that uh, uh, this board and our administration are very concerned about the ability of our resident undergraduates to afford an education at the fine institutions here in Wisconsin. Uh, and I am not uh, uh, going to speak against the resolution as such. I just wanted to raise the question uh, about uh, that has to do with the the kind of, you know, we're doing the same thing we did before. One of the reasons I think that we lost trust in the legislature is because they gave us a 5.5% tuition cap that from year to year to year we just kept saying, yeah, we need 5.5%, yeah, we need 5.5%. The sole exception to that being in 2012 when Regent Whitburn, uh, out of the blue, said, why not 4%? And the answer is nobody could answer that. It was just... No, nah, it's going to be 5.5%. Uh, and so we had a 5.5% tuition increase that year. Um, the Tuition Setting Policy Task Force, I believe, uh, has uh, uh, gone in the direction of let's do tuition increases that are uh, justified and justifiable, uh, uh, very specifically, and uh, that people who are uh, not uh, initiates of the uh, 
various campuses can actually follow, like our legislators and the parents of the students who are writing those checks, as Regent Bailey pointed out. Just asking for a CPA increase, uh, a CPI increase, kind of throws back to those days when it's just like, ah, we, we need some money, so give us some more money, as opposed to uh, what I hope will be our future practice of saying, we need some money, here's why, and here's what we've done to mitigate our requests and things like that. So, that's, that, I just wanted to express that concern. I, we understand that. Regent uh, Whitburn. Um, may I remind you, Regent, this resolution provides for a one-year CPI adjustment. We're not locking in as a board policy going forward. We couldn't do that anyway. One board can't in fact, lock in future bodies such as this with revolving membership and so on. So I think that any uh, action to, to annualize this on an ongoing basis would be a subject for a future discussion, but that's not the intention of this resolution, correct? Uh, Regent Carroll? I just want to affirm that, that this the task force should come up with the new methodology for figuring out a formula that could be used and justified. I agree with Regent Whitburn. This should be one year. This should be just forward as far as it can go. One of the things that, uh, one of the benefits of the task force is that it's not only developing the rationale, but it's also analyzing what is a pricing. How do we price our, what is, what, first of all, what is our product? What is the cost of our product and how do we price that that product. And what comes out of the task force may be an entirely new approach to how we manage tuition setting policy. But it requires a clear understanding of the results of the task force, a clear understanding of by the Board of Regents and also by our stakeholders. And that requires a certain amount of time. And so we are going to, we are very pre pleased and happy with the work that's been done over the last, uh, over the last six months and which will be continue to be done. And it is the intent of this, it is the intent that uh, the results that come out of the task force after having uh, the opportunity to have our stakeholders weigh in on it will be, uh, will be a rationale that we'll use going forward. So thank you for your comments, and we very much appreciate what you've said. Other comments? Yes, Regent Peterson. You know, you know, so um, I've been on this board since July of 2012. I've never voted on a tuition matter. Um, as I look at my fellow counterpart board members, short of perhaps Ed and Jerry, no one, and, and Regina, perhaps, has ever voted on a tuition matter. Um, all of us have been confirmed by the state legislature. The expectation as a Board of Regents member is that you are judicious about your financial accountability, most notably as it relates to tuition. So I'm very supportive of this measure because I think it puts forward the notion that the regents, as our perhaps most important responsibility, is to address the, 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 the financial aspects of college and the affordability of college. I am confident that this board will not be uh, egregious about tuition increases. Uh, but I'm also very, very supportive of the notion that we take that function back. Uh, this legislature has all confirmed us and has confidence that we will um, exercise good financial judgment, and, uh, and, I, and I, I'm confident we will. So I speak in favor of this, and I hope we pass it. Thank you. Their comments? All right, uh, seeing none, all in favor of the resolution, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Thank you very much. Next, I'll call on Regent Many Deeds.
uh, to read the resolution of appreciation for UW-Eau Claire hosting our meeting. Morning. This is the resolution of appreciation for the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire campus. Whereas the members of the Board of Regents are pleased to recognize the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire as the official host campus for the Board's October 16, uh, 2016 meeting, and whereas the Board is grateful for the generous hospitality extended this month by Chancellor James Schmidt and the entire Blue Gold community, and whereas the Board appreciated hearing Chancellor Schmidt's presentation, Partners in Wisconsin's Future, and whereas the Business and Finance Committee learned how UW-Eau Claire is encouraging innovation and change, and the members of the Ready Committee, Research, Economic Development and Innovation, listened to a CEO panel discussion led by Chancellor Schmidt on business and community mobilization, specifically UW-Eau Claire's focus on economic development, undergraduate research, and business partnership. And whereas the Capital Planning and Budget Committee learned how UW-Eau Claire is opening doors through campus community collaborations. And whereas the Education Committee thanks Provost Patricia Klein for presenting UW-Eau Claire's academic master plan. And whereas board members were glad to attend the groundbreaking of the Confluence Arts Center which will be a three theater arts center used by UW-Eau Claire performing arts students and faculty, as well as Eau Claire Regional Arts Council, community arts organizations, and visit Eau Claire. And whereas the board was delighted to hear from Derek Dalk, a UW-Eau Claire senior majoring in liberal studies, who was featured in this month's student spotlight. Be it now therefore resolved that the Board of Regents hereby thanks UW-Eau Claire for this month's informative presentations, its forward-thinking spirit, and its many continued con contributions to the UW system and to the state of Wisconsin. Congratulations. And we all echo that again. Thank you very much, Chancellor Schmidt. Are there any communications, petitions, or memorials for the Regents? Any? All right. Next, I would ask all the board members to please stay in place while we complete the roll call uh, to move into closed session. Uh, the Regents that will then, will then locate into the Menominee Room, uh, Regent Bailing, would you please read the closed session resolution? I can, and thank you. I move that the Board of Regents now move into closed session under 1985-1A to consider personnel histories related to the naming of a facility at a UW-Madison and also under 1985-1F confer with the council regarding pending or potential litigation as well